So my name is Jim Weaver. I'm honored that you, uh, that you found the room and made it all the way down here to, uh, uh, to watch me present and talk about Machine Learning Exposed. Um, I, it's a, it's, this is actually, other than the, the Ignite talk that I did last, uh, last evening, this is the first time I've given this presentation. So um, I would appreciate it if, as you, I've only got 30 minutes, so I can't entertain lots of questions, but if you have questions, it'll point out maybe some points that I'm just completely overlooking and not making it clear enough. So please do ask questions. Um, I may say, you know, I'll get to that later or, or um, you know, defer it or maybe, uh, you know, meet me outside. And, and I mean, not, not like that, but you know what I mean. Uh, just uh, let's go outside and uh, or afterwards. Or Actually, there's a break after this, a long break. And so I'll be, you know, if you want to come up after after, uh, on the stage after the presentation, I'll be glad to, um, be glad to uh, answer any questions that you have that I can answer. Also, um, just kind of a, a, a housekeeping note, uh, my daughter, uh, she's, she's 20, she's in college, um, she says that I don't smile enough when I'm on stage. And so the last thing she said to me, uh, you know, when, when we were, the family was kissing her, each other goodbye was, Dad, um, smile during your presentation. So if you give me some signals, if I'm not smiling enough or whatever, just uh, maybe give me some signals or shout out, hey, smile, Jim, or something. I, I would appreciate that. I'd like to kind of get in that habit. I'm sorry, what? Smile now. Oh, smile now. Thank you. Yeah, so, <laughs> but I am smiling. <laughs> so anyway, so... Um, uh, my, my Twitter handle is JavaFExpert, and um, I've uh, I tweeted these slides, so if you go to Twitter and look at JavaFExpert, you can find these slides. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is show you a, uh, a, an introductory video. This is um, by a gentleman named Andrew Eng. Anybody heard of Andrew Eng? Okay, you have, you have, okay. Um, so, Andrew Eng is uh, one of the founders of Coursera, as well as uh, just a luminary in the machine learning field. And so he's done this great, uh, like, the Stanford University course on machine learning, and, um, and it's offered for free on Coursera. He's also the CTO of Baidu, which is, uh, Baidu is a social networking kind of company in China, very, very large. And uh, I just wanted to um, play the introduction to his, um, uh, his um, course, introduction video to his course, which will then be kind of an intro to my presentation here. So here we go. This is Andrew Ng. What is machine learning? You probably use it dozens of times a day without even knowing it. Each time you do a web search. Going to start it over. What right. is machine learning? You probably use it dozens of times a day without even knowing it. Each time you do a web search on Google or Bing, that works so well because their machine learning software has figured out how to rank web pages. When Facebook or Apple's photo application recognizes your friends in your pictures, that's also machine learning. Each time you read your email and a spam filter saves you from having to wade through tons of spam, again, that's because your computer has learned to distinguish spam from non-spam email. So that's machine learning is a science of getting computers to learn without being explicitly programmed. One of the research projects that I'm working on is getting robots to tidy up the house. How do you go about doing that? Well, what you can do is have the robot watch you demonstrate the task and learn from that. The robot can then watch what objects you pick up and where to put them and try to do the same thing even when you aren't there. For me, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is the AI or artificial intelligence problem. Building truly intelligent machines which can do just about anything that you or I can do. Many scientists think the best way to make progress on this is through learning algorithms called neural networks, which mimic how the human brain works. And I'll teach you about that too. In this class, you learn about machine learning and get to implement them yourself. I hope you sign up on our website and join us. So I can highly recommend that course. It's, it's very good. I've, I've, I'm going through it now. Um, I've watched all the videos, and now I just have to catch up the homework, right, so, so that I can actually get course credit for it. Um, so uh, that was kind of the opening slide there. And then, uh, so some of the applications that he 
uh, talked about were like you know building a robot that'll clean your house and things like that. Um, another one might be self-driving cars. If like so, the technology, one of the main technologies behind self-driving cars is machine learning because the you, you, the, the car has to learn how to drive, how to, you know, how to avoid obstacles, things like that, and it does that with machine learning. Also, uh, generating image descriptions. So uh, the application then will analyze an image, pick out all the objects, and then go further than that even by, um, by explaining what's going on in the image and putting out in, in a English language text what's going on in the image. Uh, at quite a bit of detail, so that's another one. There are, there are some different categories of machine learning. The first category I'd like to discuss, and which will be kind of the topic of most of the presentation, and that's called supervised learning. Supervised learning is where, uh, where you train the model. You, you actually train um, by giving the features, which are the the attributes of the data sets that you're giving it. That's kind of the input. And then you give it labels, which are the, the right answers. So you're training with a data set that has the features and the labels. And so that's called supervised learning because someone is supervising that process. So here's a very simple example that uses regression. Uh, regression I'm saying regression because it's got a, uh, a continuous output. So in this case, where, where uh, the input is the square footage of a house, and the output is uh, the price. And so in the data set that we're training with, we've got several instances of the square footage and price, and then we can plot that on the graph here, and um, it's regression because that the output is continuous rather than in categories or classifications like I'll show you an example of in a little bit. So notice we can plot a line. Uh, the first line, the straight line, is a linear uh, plot trying to use uh, kind of um, a linear model to, to plot, but it doesn't really fit really well. And then there's another one that uses a curve. So the, the, the function would be a curve that then fits the data a little bit better. So it's, again, it's called supervised learning because the right answers are given. Um, another category of learning is unsupervised learning. So that's where uh, you don't give the right answers. All you give it is data, and then the learning algorithms then try to find the structure in the data. So one idea of structure, one, one facet of structure, would be uh, clustering. Maybe the data has uh, different centers that are they're clustered around. So, so you can find that um, and, and start to maybe identify markets, uh, market segments or social networking um, uh, foci and things like that. Another area of learning is reinforcement learning. And that's where you have, um, you train through giving reinforcement or rewards for doing something well. Uh, it's very popular in, in game playing. As a matter of fact, there's an AlphaGo project, you've probably heard about it, from Google DeepMind, in which uh, the algorithm that was taught partly by um, reinforcement learning then beat a top professional Go player. And um, so then, now we're gonna go back to supervised learning. Um, so here is a very um, kind of a popular classification data set it's called the iris flower data set. And in that data set, as you can see over here, the features or the, the, uh, the, the data, the rows in the data have four features. Those features are dimensions of an iris flower, both the, the width and height of the petal and the width and height of the sepal. And then the labels are the, the uh, species of which there are three. And so this data set has 150 records in it, and we can use that then to train our, our model. Again, if you have questions, please let me know, and that'll help me fill in any, any holes that I'm, that I'm not communicating. So 
since there are four features, there are four dimensions in this data. And so if we're going to try to, try to visualize the data, we really have to visualize it in four different dimensions. And that's what this chart does. So we can see this dimension if we're, if we're comparing this feature to this feature, that is the perspective there. And we can see where the separations are. Comparing this one to this one, we can see where the separations are for classification purposes. So in the machine learning algorithm, it's going to find those decision boundaries. That's its job, is to find those decision boundaries so that when we input a, a different, different dimensions for an iris plant that we might pick, then it can try to classify that using the knowledge that we've trained it with, okay? So um, kind of the, the biggest breakthroughs in machine learning have been, were kind of in the 80s and 90s, uh, but then they were um, uh, artificial neural networks. But then they kind of fell out of favor because Moore's law hadn't really caught up with, um, with the, the processing power that it really requires. But now there's been this convergent to where Moore's law has caught up in terms of uh, distributed processing power, just raw CPU cycles, storage, um, with what is required to, to truly be able to train that much data. Um, and so it's really come back into favor. So artificial neural networks are based very, um, very kind of strictly, very, uh, very closely to way, the way the human brain operates in terms of neurons and synapses and in terms of uh, calculations and things like that for representing and being able to then process and make decisions on, on, uh, on future predictions. So the human brain has synapses and neurons. It's got dendrites, which are uh, inputs. It, got, it has axons, which are output wires. And so with a neural network, as we see in this next one, we have inputs, we have outputs. And with an artificial neural network, the anatomy is on the left we have input layer, on the right, we have an output layer, and then we have one or more hidden layers. And uh, then we have neurons and synapses. So um, in order to help me kind of understand uh, machine learning, uh, being a developer, what I decided to do was create an application that would visualize, would help me visualize a neural network. And so uh, being a Spring developer, working for Pivotal, um, I used Spring, and also uh, being a Java developer, I used a learning, uh, machine learning library called Deep Learning for J. And um, I'll, I'll show you the website here pretty soon. These are the GitHub repositories for this application. This is the server side of it, the, the Java Spring side of it that uses Deep Learning for J. And this is the client side, which uses Angular 2. So I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, run this application for you. Um, so if you download it in, in GitHub, from GitHub, uh, and uh, I recommend opening it up in IntelliJ um, and, uh, and running the application. So now it is, uh, the server is running, and then I'm gonna go to a browser and uh, open and uh, reload here to localhost 8080. And what you see here then is, uh, is all but one of these are examples from the Deep Learning for J libraries. And uh, one is one that I'm going to uh, show you that I've added uh, from, from, from some data. So for example, I'll, I'll go to this iris, iris flower data set. So notice, uh, notice when I clicked it, what, what, I'll, I'll do it again, and you can see these numbers change. Those numbers are weights. And as, as those numbers are changing, the model is actually being trained. And I'll go through some detail what happens when the model is trained. Um, so this application then allows me to, uh, to visualize the network 
Here, here are the, uh, the, the input layer, the output layer, and two hidden layers. Also, it allows me to make predictions. So I can enter another iris. Maybe it's uh, five centimeters um, high. The sepal is five centimeters high. Maybe the, uh, the width is uh, three centimeters. The petal length is two centimeters. The petal width is two. And so then I asked it to make a prediction, and then it predicts that that is a, a versicolor iris. And it does that through doing a feed forward kind of thing. So once the model has been trained, again, which I'll kind of walk you through, all of the, uh, the synapses, the wiring between layers, between the neurals, neurons in the different layers, then are assigned values or weights. And then each neuron itself is assigned a weight, and we call that a bias. And so the, the trick then is to be able to assign the right weights for every synapse and every neuron so that when I do this feed forward mechanism, it will come up with the right answer. So what's the feed forward mechanism? So I will uh, um, we'll show you that in a, in a couple of slides here. So let's, we, let's see where we're at in the presentation. Um, so I want to show you the, uh, the application architecture. This is a developer conference after all, so I want to, to show you the application architecture. It's a single page HTML5 client. It uses Angular 2. It also uses a visualization library called VizJS, which is a JavaScript-based visualization library. And then we have on the server side, again, we have this Spring application, Java Spring application, that uses both WebSockets and REST services. One of the things I really love about Spring is how easy it is to create services, REST services and WebSocket services. So uh, at a very high level, what happens is the HTML5 client when I, when I clicked one of the examples, it then connects and subscribes to the server. And then as the model is being trained, it is asynchronously sending JSON representations of the neural network, all those weights for all the different layers and all the different neurons. Um, so it's sending those back, and that's why we're seeing those update on the screen quickly. And then when I do the prediction, there's a prediction rest service that receives the values, the feature values that I've sent it for predictions, and then it comes back with the prediction and then the activations. So this is a link, this deeplearningforj.org is a link to the Deep Learning for J library. It's very good. Um, it's also uh, really good as far as uh, resources and documentations uh, to, um, to explain uh, lots of different concepts around uh, deep learning, machine learning, uh, neural networks. So here is uh, a neural network that has been trained for uh, a simple case so that I can kind of walk through this feed forward and back propagation mechanism. So um, I'll go ahead and pull up that example in our application, and that's the XOR example. So XOR, as you know, takes two binary inputs, I've got 10 minutes left, <laughs> two binary inputs and outputs either true or false. So if, uh, if I predicted um, uh, with XOR, if I predicted one and one, is that gonna be true or false? Somebody tell me, true or false. It's gonna be false because it's, it's not exclusively OR. So I'll do the prediction, and sure enough, it's false. But if I say one and zero, it is true. And so here are the weights that have made that happen, and then um, here are the calculations that have happened. So now, with, now I'll go to this slide here. Um, and when, you, when, a, uh, when a neural network is trained, it goes through two phases, forward propagation and backward propagation. So the forward propagation takes, uh, so what, what happens is it populates all of the, the weights with random numbers, very low random numbers. And then it takes the data in the model, 
the features, and then it does the calculation that I'm gonna run through, and then it compares it to the right answers. And, the, and that comparison, the difference, is called the cost. So the challenge then is to try to minimize the cost, and that happens iteratively over time. So the, the forward propagation is, is pretty simple, actually. What happens is you multiply the inputs for a, for a given neuron, you multiply the inputs uh, by their weights. So we're going to calculate for this neuron. So we'll take one times 8.54 plus zero times 8.55, and then plus, uh, that equals 8.54. And then we're gonna add the bias. So we'll take that 8.54 and add the, three, the negative 399, and that we come up with 4.55. And then for each neuron that's not an input neuron, you have an activation function. So the activation function then um, changes that into, uh, into essentially a probability at that layer for that neuron. And so uh, a very common activation function is a sigmoid activation function. And the calculation for that is one over one plus e to the negative of whatever that, uh, whatever that uh, value was. And so then we come up with, with 0.99. So at this level, there's a you know, 0.99 per, uh, you know, percent uh, or 99% probability that that's the right answer. And so then you just, uh, uh, the, the algorithm then calculates this one and then goes to the next layer. And so it feeds forward. And again, it takes the results of the calculation compare for each element, for each row in the data set and compares them to the actual results um, or to the, to the trained results. And then it comes up with this cost function. So then um, in the, the backward propagation, it iteratively, iteratively tries to change all the weights and biases in the model to minimize the cost. And so that's an iterative kind of process. <clears throat> so over, this, over the space of uh, you know, hundreds, maybe even thousands of iterations, it's changing those weights and then recalculating until you get a minimum cost and then you're done. And so that's what back, back propagation is. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. Okay, so the question is, how do we get the values? 8.54, oh, 8.55. .5. Okay, so uh, that was, those were a result of the, the, the fitting of the model that was done by the algorithm. Yeah. How much is the library doing of How much is the library? Deep learning? Uh, The, the libraries, the Deep Learning for J library is doing all of the, the neural net kind of processing. All I'm doing is putting a front end onto those things and then, and then creating the visualization. Well, I, let's, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll meet me outside. No, I mean, come up, come up to the stage afterwards. Um, so what I want to do then is play with another data set. So if you, who's heard of Kaggle? Okay, so Kaggle is a great, site for data, uh, uh, data science and machine learning th enthusiasts. I went to this site and um, w tried to find an interesting data set. So one that kind of caught my eye was speed dating. So um, what that has in it is it's got lots of features in it. I narrowed it down to three features, just for example. Uh, one was in a speed dating. Everybody familiar with, anybody not familiar with what speed dating is? Okay, so. Um, in speed dating, then, uh, in this experiment, they, uh, they wrote down, uh, uh, kind of took a survey after their speed date about uh, how attractive they thought that the person was, how intelligent, how fun, and lots of other features. And then they also put down whether they were going to uh, ask that person for another date. And so 
um, in Kaggle, there's, uh, they have a nice data set for that, 8,300 8, rows. And so uh, when I used that to train the data set, um, I took 65% of the rows for training and then 35% of the rows for testing. So what happens is, as it's being trained, uh, you reserve some of them for testing, and that way the training algorithm can verify um, how accurate it was. And so that's, that's the idea there. So here's some code that uh, it's Java code that's using the, the, the um, Deep Learning for J libraries in which we are configuring our neural net, giving it a seed for animization, telling it how many iterations for back, uh, back uh, propagation, um, telling it um, what the activation function is going to be. We've been using sigmoid, but, um, but in this case, we're using hyperbolic tan uh, tangent. Um, learning rate in those iterations, there's this thing called gradient descent, if you've heard of gradient descent. But um, so the learning rate, as it's kind of dialing in on an optimal, optimal weights for a good fit, it uses this thing called a learning rate, and the, the, the lower that rate, the more gradual the descent is. Um, and so then here are the layers, and, um, uh, and so here's the, here's the example, and I'll go ahead and run the example. Um, so here's speed dating, and uh, it's, it's interesting, as I was running these, I, uh, I found that, uh, you know, it's, it's not a head scratcher, but um, I, I found that uh, we seem to value uh, attractiveness more than we do intelligence. So, <laughs> more, so, so um, you know, I could put the same scores in, but when I, when I, uh, when I reverse attractiveness and intelligence, it seemed like uh, more often or not, uh, uh, it changed whether the outcome was a second date or not. So anyway, here's a six for attractiveness, maybe eight for intelligence, and uh, let's make this person really fun. Uh, predict, and um, yeah, just just uh, just skated by for for another date there. So um, uh, one note is uh, note that on the uh, the input layer uh, that we're normalizing that data. So e the predictions were seven, eight, seven, nine, and eight, but the data that were actually that are actually in the neurons in the input layer are 43, 1 out of 7, 0.85, those are normalized. Uh, when, when, the, uh, when the algorithm fits the data, when it's training the data, uh, it, it normalizes data. And so um, we, we make sure that our inputs are converted to normalized data. So um, I think I'm, uh, I've got one minute left for questions, and then again, we have a long break. So please ask your question. As for the deep learning for J? Uh, yeah, uh, and compared to the what Cloud Foundry or AWS or the machine learning? Oh, compared to Cloud Foundry? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not aware of machine learning in Cloud Foundry. So, okay. Other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, uh, where do we store the results of the training? If we had a, a, a long training cycle, where could we store it? And so that's, that's, a, that's a perfect lead into uh, kind of the, where I want to take this in the future. Uh, I want to um, actually put that up into Cloud Foundry. I want to make it available for you know, microservices. And so it needs, I need to be able to train models and keep it around. And so, uh, with Deep Learning for J, there is the ability to export uh, the model, and so I would probably do that in some type of, uh, you know, cache, caching database. Other questions? Yes. Okay. So the question is, how does one determine what's called the architecture of a neural network? Um, and uh, specifically, when, when my colleague asked about a uh, number of layers and, um, um, and number of neurons in each layer, uh, uh, another word for that 
is uh, hyperparameters. So the small parameters, uh, the weights in the, in the synapses and, and neurons, those are parameters, but, but those things are hyperparameters. And the question is, is how do we figure out um, how many? And so I guess this is my last question because I just got a blank sign. And so um, there are some heuristics, but um, it is, there are no hard and fast rules. Um, so there are some heuristics, like for example, Andrew Eng in his, uh, in his course talks about um, maybe a, a good rule of thumb for a, a start might be you take the number of input neurons in the input layer and then maybe double that and then and maybe have a couple of uh, hidden layers and, um, and maybe double that number of neurons in each of the hidden layers. And then of course you're gonna have one output you're gonna have in your output layer, you're gonna have one neuron for each, each label, each output, and then start there. And then as you, um, as you train the model, as you see it run, you notice how, did I show the graph? I showed you a graph, yeah. So you just notice how it's, um, how it's optimizing. You know, is it, is it optimizing um, uh, at a very low point? Um, is it, uh, is it going up and down? Is it, um, uh, is it, uh, is it not even uh, reaching the bottom? Is it, is it maybe instead of being 98% accurate, is it staying at 60%? And so then diagnosing those problems, like for example, the speed learning data set, um, there is, it's not as precise as the iris data set was, right? So the, the categories, the classification uh, boundaries weren't as clear, aren't as clear because we're talking about humans, you know? And so uh, the accuracy is maybe 71%. And so I noticed when that was, when that was uh, optimizing, it was, it was staying around uh, down to about accuracy of about 70%. But so you're, you're kind of watching how it's trained and then trying to assess do I need more resolution? Do I need more layers? And, and those kinds of things. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's not a science yet. It's, uh, it's more uh, of an art, but yeah. So that's the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attentiveness. And um, if you do have any other questions, please uh, come up and see me. Thank you.